Well, uh, hi everybody. I uh, I hope you're all enjoying the uh, International Astronomy Day, Astronomy Day presentations that we've had so far. Some pretty interesting stuff there, and uh, I want to thank Jim for inviting me to talk to you about uh, getting started in astrophotography. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly one of my favorite topics. Uh, uh, I've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to jump right in here and uh, and get started with it. So astrophotography itself is a, a pretty broad ranging topic. Uh, as you've seen, if you've watched some of the presentations, uh, there's all sorts of equipment uh, available uh, and required to do some of this pretty cool stuff that you've been uh, seeing on the screen there. So whether you're interested in photographing distant galaxies or things like auroras, uh, high resolution imaging of the moon, solar eclipses, or beautiful nebulas in our own galaxy. All of these things require typically their own approaches to, to capture good images there, and uh, certainly an investment of, of time as, as well as money. And uh, so obviously can't cover all of that today. That's not my intent here. So this uh, presentation is really targeted at those folks that uh, perhaps have been to some of our star parties, uh, some of our meetings, and have seen uh, uh, a lot of amazing pictures from some of the very talented people we have uh, in, in our area. And, uh, and these, these images may have triggered your interest in, uh, in getting into astrophotography itself. So my presentation is targeted at those that haven't done any or perhaps just very, very minimal experimentation with astrophotography. It's basically a very much a, a beginner's uh, introduction into getting into astrophotography. So without further ado, I'll jump into this. Uh, today's cameras, uh, you've got quite a variety of cameras to choose from. Uh, as you've seen with uh, Jim's presentation, uh, he's, he's into uh, using uh, astronomical video cameras and, uh, and CCD cameras, uh, but you also can do a lot of excellent imaging with, uh, with uh, today's DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. Even cell phones and, and video cameras uh, have, have the capability to do certain forms of, of astro imaging. We'll focus on DSLRs and mirrorless because these uh, these are amongst the most popular uh, cameras used by uh, people that are actively engaged in astrophotography in one form or another. So the very basic setup, the the the, the minimal setup that you need to, to get started in astrophotography is what you're seeing here. And that's uh, essentially a camera that allows you to do full manual exposure control like a DSLR. Um, the uh, advantage with a DSLR is that you have interchangeable lenses. You can, uh, you can attach a wide angle lens uh, for broad vistas like nightscapes, uh, also telephoto lenses for doing close-ups uh, of the moon and, uh, and other uh, larger scale phenomena in the sky. You need a sturdy tripod, uh, a ball head mount so that you can aim your camera, and you need a shutter release. This, this shutter release is an important piece there because the thing that what you want to avoid with astrophotography is you want to avoid having to touch the, uh, the the shutter button on your camera because you're going to wind up jiggling your image. So you need some sort of a release that allows you to trigger an image uh, without actually touching the camera. And, and of all of these, the, the best is an intervalometer. That's uh, the small handheld uh, device that you see at, at the right. Um, this is essentially a small computer that uh, jacks into uh, one of the ports in your camera and allows you to shoot uh, uh, exposures uh, pretty much from uh, one second up to any, any length that you, that you need. Uh, it al also allows you to do things like uh, multiple exposures if you're interested in doing time lapses. So a very handy device available uh, in the aftermarket for most DSLR ca uh, camera models. Um, uh, in lieu of that, you can also use just a simple trigger, also readily available. Uh, this is just a, basically an on and off button, uh, and means that you'll have to uh, uh, click the button on the on the trigger release for every image that you want to take. Uh, you can also get wireless remotes uh, for your camera uh, that uh, that that will allow you to remotely shoot. Um, you can even use your camera self timer. All that's a little bit more awkward because it means you're going to wind up uh, having to touch your camera to reset the timer for each image. So, and the last one, the least uh, on the list, is your is your finger for emergency use only. Because as I say, you really don't want to jiggle your image. All right. So before you get started, 
in, into this, there are a few things that you really need to look at uh, because astrophotography is different than most other forms of, of photography that you'll get into. It's, it's challenging and it also requires you to use settings that you're you may or may not be familiar with settings that aren't usually used in more conventional terrestrial photography. So the big thing is you need to know how to manually set your, your camera controls. You have to dive into your camera manual and learn how to actually uh, set things in your menus and use the different buttons to, to, to have full manual control over your camera. Because you're either, you're, you're typically going to use uh, the M for manual or the B for bulb uh, settings for your exposures. Um, the manual settings allow you to, 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 to choose an exposure length in, from the shortest length that your camera is possible up to about 30 seconds. And the B setting is used uh, to, uh, to do exposures longer than 30 seconds. You also need to know how to adjust your lens aperture openings. Uh, that's your f-stop. Uh, this, this dictates how much light uh, is, is uh, transferred uh, through the lens into your camera. Uh, you need to, set, to be able to set the ISO levels. And you should set your camera to record raw images if that's available. Most DSLRs will allow you to shoot raw images. The big, big advantage in shooting raw is that uh, it captures all the data that your cam camera is capable of, of getting from the image. Uh, JPEGs are, are, a, are a lossy format that actually winds up throwing away a lot of the data that your, your, your camera has captured. So with a raw image, you can change uh, a lot of factors after you shoot your image. When you're in the comfort of your home on a rainy night, you want to process your image, you can go in and change color balance and picture style and all, all manner of things if you've got the raw image to work with. So very important. Um, manually pro practice focusing your lens. Here's another thing that, I mean, we're, 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 we're used to in terrestrial shooting, probably relying pretty heavily on autofocusing. That's pretty much useless in astrophotography because most of the objects that we're dealing with, most of the scenes are, are quite dark and uh, autofocus is of limited or no value there. So turn that off. And uh, if your lens has image stabilization, turn that off as well. And before you go out shooting at night, try some daytime tests with whatever lenses you plan to use. Um, go out in the daytime when you can see your camera controls easily and uh, aim at some distant objects like a TV tower or an antenna somewhere or whatever, but uh, a distant object and, and practice manually focusing it. You can use your live view for this. this is, uh, that's, a, that's a great way to do it. Um, zoom in as much as possible and just try adjusting your lens manually. You'll find that uh, when you're close to getting a really good focus, it just takes a little bit of adjustment one way or another to, to pin that focus per uh, perfectly or to be off with the focus. So practice this because uh, you're going to need to do this in the dark. All right. So as to the types of things that you can photograph, um, with, with a basic setup like this, you're not going to be imaging distant galaxies or nebulas, as I showed you, but you're going to concentrate on things that are, 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 are relatively bright and, uh, and don't require a, a lot of magnification. In other words, a lot of focal length uh, on your lenses. Uh, the sun is the nearest star to us here on Earth and, and makes for a good topic. Uh, or object rather, but I, I show this first because there's a caveat here. The sun is extremely powerful uh, in, in the light that it puts out. Uh, certainly less so in a, in a sunset scenario like this um, because the atmosphere is doing a lot of filtering, but uh, it can still be pretty bright. Uh, most type of sun imaging requires special use of filters. And this is important because uh, if, if you expose your, your camera without filters uh, to the sun, you can easily fry your, 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 your camera's uh, sensor. Uh, it's like putting a magnifying glass on, uh, you know, on, and burning your initials into a piece of wood. The same kind of idea uh, is going to happen on, on, your, on your image sensor, right? And you really want to kind of avoid that. And uh, also your eyesight, right? You, you don't want to be looking through your viewfinder at the sun because uh, that will damage your eyesight before you feel anything. And the last thing you want to do is, um, is uh, have impaired vision because of this. So please be extremely careful whenever you're shooting the sun. Be safe, not sorry. Paul, I have a few questions. Yes. 
First question is thoughts, direct observation. Is it more real than EAA or astrophotography? I'm, I'm sorry, come again? Uh, one, a person was wondering, is direct observation more, quote, real than EAA or astrophotography? I guess it's just an opinion. You mean visual observing? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, that depends, I suppose, on what it, what it is you're looking at. Uh, it's true. As, uh, as Jim mentioned uh, in, in his talk, uh, cameras allow you to do things that your eyes simply can't, right? So you, you can see, uh, you, you, can, you can image distant objects that you never have a, a chance to see, even if you had a very large telescope at your disposal. Uh, you can also see different wavelengths that our eyes aren't sensitive to. So it really depends on, on, on what it is you're looking at. Right, okay. Uh, for, for a view like this uh, uh, of the sun, uh, this this was very close to what I was seeing uh, uh, visually. Uh, this I actually took this when I went down to watch the solar eclipse uh, in, down in Wyoming a couple of years ago, and it was very close to the to the true view that I was seeing. I was lucky to catch this just as the sun was going down. Uh, for other objects that you're, I'm going to show you here, uh, the camera reveals much more than you can see with your eyes. Yeah. Uh, second question, are there issues with power for DSLR cameras? Would you need a uniform power supply set up for the camera? Uh, no, uh, the DSLRs, uh, a, lot, a lot of them, uh, they have very good batteries these days and, uh, and those batteries will, uh, will, will take you through a good portion of the night. One of the points that I'll mention uh, shortly in a, in a list of things to consider is to have spare batteries. So uh, I, I, I like when I when I go out and shoot in the field there, I like to keep my setup uh, to a very minimum because on the other end of it, you know that I do some really sort of high end imaging where I have a my own observatory and uh, and all sorts of equipment. So I, I like the difference. I like the extremes. I like uh, going simple sometimes out in the field uh, as opposed to when I when I when I carry a lot of equipment with me. So. Yeah, just, uh, just carry a couple of spare batteries with your camera. That's always a good idea. Okay. Why do you need to turn off image stabilization? Will it not steady the image better? Uh, it won't because it'll, it, it can get fooled uh, by, by that. Uh, uh, it again, it depends on, on the target. That, that you're that you're looking at for most types of uh, astro imaging especially if you're doing just ca a stationary camera on a tripod uh, you're, you're not moving it anyway I mean uh, unless you're photographing in a, you know with a with a howling wind at your back in which case like Jim with the sandstorm you probably shouldn't be out there anyway uh, so most okay. of the time uh, stabilization uh, isn't isn't really a, an, an issue and if the seeing is so bad that it's causing jitter like that, uh, stabilization is probably not going to help you a whole lot. Plus, image stabilization draws a fair bit of power from your camera battery and will shorten your camera battery's uh, uh, duration out in the field. Okay, and last question right now. For those of us wearing glasses, do you think it's better to focus with the camera while wearing glasses or without them? That that's a question uh, I've been asked many many times, and what I what my experience has been is it depends on the individual. So try with and without. Some folks find like they just can't do focusing uh, without their glasses. Other folks uh, say that it's actually better uh, uh, without. So it really depends on the individual. Uh, and so what you're with, especially with today's cameras, where you have a you have a display on the back of your camera that shows you what you're getting. Uh, uh, there you're, you're, you know, treat it as you would your camera monitor or your TV, whatever, whatever allows you to see the sharpest view on the screen is, is what's going to work best for you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So other types of objects that you can shoot with a, just a camera on a, on a stationary tripod, uh, with a telephoto lens, you can get some really, uh, nice imaging of the moon. Uh, you can get some pretty pretty spanky detail uh, if you've got a, a, a telephoto lens. The, the the moon is a bright object, and so you don't have to worry about super long exposures. You can uh, you can shoot the moon at, at at small fractions of a second, and get pretty crisp imaging. You can also go with a wide angle, and this is where your creative side comes in. You can you can uh, if you if you put yourself in a good place, like any photography, composition is important. If you put yourself in a in a good place with an interesting foreground vista, and you plan ahead where where the moon might be rising over a cityscape, you can do some pretty attractive imaging with this. And and again, I stress 
astrophotography is 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 I think it's more art than it is science. It's certainly a combination of both, but certainly in terms of processing and composition, when you're doing things like wide vistas like this, um, it's very much an artistic pursuit. And so you've got to consider both the near and the uh, and the far objects that you're shooting, and and place yourself in 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 a situation where you'll get what what it is you can imagine. Um, also with uh, with telephoto lenses, uh, again, our moon is a, is a very cooperative uh, body because it is the second brightest thing that we see in the in the in the night sky. <clears throat> so uh, lunar eclipses are are uh, are a treat to photograph when we get a clear sky. Again, they don't require long exposures, and so a telephoto lens will allow you to uh, to capture some really nice uh, uh, lunar eclipse photography. Uh, if you if you find your, find yourself out uh, going for a night session and uh, and get skunked by uh, by fogs move fog moving in or something like that, uh, you can take that to your advantage too and create again get creative and uh, and use the the moon filtering through fog to create some some interesting night effects. That's the moon, by the way, not the sun. <laughs> All right. So one of the considerations. Um, uh, in, in photography, in, in astrophotography, certainly is is what you're shooting and where you're shooting it. And certainly, with a DSLR, um, this this gives you an idea of a, the difference that a, a dark sky can uh, can make for you. This is a really quick panorama that I put together. I just stitched a bunch of images together. Didn't try to even it out or anything, so you can see various different frames here, uh, spanning quite a wide uh, wide range. And this was photographed about. Uh, 30 kilometers or so out of town uh, and it shows uh, that that thing that looks like nuclear dawn in the middle is actually the light dome of Ottawa. So that's that's a combination of all the artificial lighting that you you see from from buildings and businesses and so forth uh, that's that's in the city. So if you're in the city you're dealing with that you're you're immersed in that light dome and uh, you're going to capture a lot of that light and and that light will will uh, overwhelm uh, a lot of the dimmer objects that you can see in the sky like stars uh, um, dimmer meteors certainly auroras uh, and often the milky way too and unless you're doing special filtering or or you're doing uh you're doing um uh, imaging and things like uh, in, in the in the infrared and, and such that, that can get around a lot of that light pollution as jim was explaining in in some of his earlier talk so dark sky sight is is a, is a is a is a treat, and it will allow you to do a lot of interesting imaging uh, of dimmer objects. So things to consider when you're heading out, uh, if you want to head out to a dark sky, like uh, like some of the dark sky preserves that we have here, or think places like FLO, um, you want to you want to have an imaging location that's free of ground lights. In other words, you don't want a lot of houses nearby or or cars on on highways with their with their headlights. You want to uh, try to avoid setting up on on asphalt or cemented surface, uh, especially in the warm season, because during the day these absorb a lot of heat from uh, from the sun, and then release it at night, which can cause a, a, a fair bit of a surprising amount of shimmering in your images. Uh, safety is also a concern. Uh, I have to mention this one because. Um, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, you, you can you can have visitations by four-legged creatures, um, even two-legged creatures that may interrupt your 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 planned peaceful night under the stars. Also, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, you can you can wind up with problems like uh, uh, you know dead batteries in your car, uh, that type of thing. So you need to be careful, uh, especially if you're if you are out in the middle of nowhere and out of cell phone range. Things to bring other than your imaging equipment. Again, these are things you might not consider uh, initially, but uh, in the summer you want bug juice, especially in the summer, because uh, you get one of those warm summer nights where the mosquitoes don't seem to go to sleep. Uh, they can be a real annoyance. Uh, also, the the air tends to get damp in our in our climate uh, in the in the evenings after sundown, and so you you do you do want a, a nice warm jacket, flashlights, uh, water, that type of thing. That's Pretty obvious stuff. In the winter, you want a very warm jacket or coat and really well insulated boots because uh, astrophotography isn't really a very physically active pursuit. Uh, so you're standing around a lot of the time, and uh, you will get cold if you're not properly dressed for it. And there's nothing that will dampen your enthusiasm more than feeling a chill in your head or your hands, right? So, and as I mentioned before, bring a spare battery or two for your camera. 
shooting the long exposures, especially if you're doing time lapses, will deplete your battery sooner than, 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 than you would expect. Um, and make sure that you have plenty of capacity on your memory chip. It's always a good idea to have a second one of those because I have seen those fail. All right, the other thing that I didn't mention, the other piece of equipment that's as important in, in our environment uh, is, is uh, something for dew control. Um, especially in the spring and the autumn, our air tends to get very damp and, uh, and it'll fog over your lens pretty quickly. So you need to, a way to control that dew. You don't want to be wiping down your lens all the time. Um, something like a, just a simple hand warmer packet that you can get uh, strapped to your, your, your lens with an elastic band or so um, can, can do the job for you. Uh, it provides a, a, a small amount of heat to your camera lens, uh, enough to keep the dew at bay. For those of us that do a lot of this type of imaging, we, we go a little bit deeper into it and we, we have a dew control system. This is basically um, a, a, a heated strap that's powered by a 12 volt uh, power field power supply. <clears throat> and again, this, this just provides a gentle amount of heat to, to your lens body, enough to keep the dew at bay from forming on your lens. All right, so when you're out in the field, suggested camera uh, settings, and again, these will vary depending on, on, your, on your conditions, on the conditions of your, of, your, uh, of your surroundings, of your sky, how dark the sky is, uh, how far out of town you are, so on. So, but just general numbers, uh, uh, set your, your aperture for the lowest F number. This will allow the maximum amount of light to, 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 to reach your camera sensor. Set your initial ISO level pretty high, uh, 800 to 6, 1600 is a good starting point. Uh, you may have to go higher or lower as the, as the night progresses. Um, set your initial exposure length to about 10 seconds. And uh, again, if this winds up being too bright for your sight, uh, try shorter times or reduce the ISO. If the image is too dark, go the other way. Try lengthening the exposure time or increasing uh, and or increasing the ISO. Note that increasing the exposure time will eventually show star trails. Uh, and on the flip side, increasing ISO will show more noise in your image. And again, set your camera to record the raw image data. Uh, this will take up more space on, on your camera chip, but it's worth having that data and you can always erase it if you don't wind up using it. All right, focusing. This is one of this is one of the things that ruins more astronomical images than anything else that I can imagine. Um, it's a lot easier nowadays with digital cameras, but um, uh, it's it's still a bit of a challenge because again, autofocus is useless for you. You need to do this manually. So what what I typically wind up doing is I wind up uh, having my camera all set up, all the settings that I want to use, and then I wind up pointing it at a very bright star. This will, uh, this will allow you usually to use your live view to do your focusing. If, if, if the star is too dim, you probably won't see it on your live view. So you, you, need, to, you need to target a bright star, even if it's not in the area that you want to photograph uh, once, you, once you've got your focus pin. So set it on a bright star, uh, engage your, uh, your live view and zoom in. Usually you can zoom in by a factor of 10 and then you'll see the star in your field. Try to do your manual focusing and try to get that star to be as much of a point as possible. You'll notice that the, 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 the smaller the star appears, the closer you're getting to focus and it'll also start to appear brighter. And there is a sweet spot. You want to hit that sweet spot. Okay. It's really, it's difficult to do that through your viewfinder. It is possible, but it's usually much more precise when you're doing live view on a bright star. So don't rush this. Take test shots. If, if the star still looks like it's a bit bloated, tweak your focus just gradually a little bit one way or the other and see if you get a better or worse image. Don't rush it. And uh, once you've got it pinned, don't touch it again. <laughs> so once you've got your focus pinned, again, don't, don't, touch, don't, don't touch that part of your, your, your camera barrel. Uh, just use your camera body to, to, uh, to uh, swing your camera around to the scene that you want to start photographing and then start shooting. So when you do start shooting, the next step is to determine just how long you want to shoot for. So I've got a series of images here that I took. Uh, uh, you can see the Milky Way just barely through, through the center of this image. Um, you want to determine for your specific sky conditions uh, uh, the optimum setting for brightness. So this is a 10 second shot. Uh, these are all taken with a Canon 70D 16 millimeter lens at f2 and ISO 3200, so fairly high. 
because I wanted to try to keep these shorter uh, exposures pretty short. So there's 10 seconds. I'll bump this up to 15 seconds. You'll notice how, how the Milky Way is more prominent. Uh, the uh, sky beside the Milky Way is also starting to lighten up a bit. I'll bump it up even more. There's 30 seconds. So you're seeing, you're getting good penetration here. You're getting a lot of detail through in the Milky Way, but you're also noticing if you if you if you uh, if you've got sharp eyes here, have a look at the uh, at the uh, left hand margin of the image. You'll notice that the stars are no longer looking like points; uh, they're looking like little streaks. That's because the the camera is stationary. You're not doing any tracking here, and the Earth is turning while you're shooting these images. So. This, this effect becomes more pronounced with the longer the exposure that you take. There's 60 seconds that you can see quite noticeably, especially on the left-hand side, uh, that the stars are definitely looking like streaks now, whereas they're less so on the right-hand side. And there's a reason for that. So what's happening here is, is that the Earth is turning while you're taking these shots. And uh, if, you, if you were to look at the, at the North Star at Polaris uh, over the course of the night, you'll see that everything seems to rotate around Polaris. That's because Polaris is very close to the North Celestial Pole, which is the point exactly over the Earth's rotational pole, the North Pole. And so as the Earth turns, all the skies seem to turn around that point. And the further away you are from, from, from Polaris, the more pronounced that rotation will be uh, for a given amount of time. So in the previous images, uh, uh, I'll flip back to that one, the, uh, the, the part, of, part of the image that was on the left-hand side is further away from Polaris than the, uh, than the part of the image on the right-hand side. And so the, the streaking is more pronounced on the left. So star streaking generally is something you want to avoid, but you can do some pretty cool stuff there. Uh, just before I get into that, this, of that sequence that I just showed you, this is the one I decided I wanted to work with. The star streaking isn't too bad on the, on the left-hand side, and I'm getting good exposure there. And I'm going to come back to this uh, in, in, a, in just a couple of minutes here, because I'm going to touch just briefly on some image processing. So I decided on 24 seconds at ISO 3200 on this particular night uh, with this particular camera configuration. So keep this one in mind. So as I said, star streaking, yeah, uh, if you do two minutes, you can see how bad that gets, and uh, it's, it's quite noticeable. Most of the time you want to avoid that, but you can actually do some pretty cool stuff with star trailing. Uh, again, this is where your artistic side comes through. Uh, you can do some interesting compositions uh, by using the fact that the stars are trailing. Uh, this one you can certainly see is, uh, is centered over Polaris, which is the bright star just uh, over the top of the tree. Uh, if you move away from Polaris there, again, you can do some interesting uh, artistic compositions uh, by making use of the fact that those stars will trail. Most of the time, though, you want, you want fairly pinpoint stars or to, ca to, ca to capture images like this, where you get nice detail on the Milky Way. Uh, again, th that streaking will not only affect the stars, but it'll, it'll affect any other objects that's in the sky uh, in your composition. So if you let the exposure go too long, the detail in the Milky Way will also start to get streaked out. So these are the types of images, again, you can catch just with a, with a wide angle lens on a stationary tripod. Just put yourself in a good, good dark sky. Uh, meteor showers is another favorite of mine. Uh, this is actually a composition of several images, stationary images, uh, taken uh, during the Gemini meteor shower. And then I use um, applications like Photoshop to, to do a composite where I can merge all the meteors I get onto one image of, of the night sky. So Paul, Bro we're at nine o'clock. Oh, okay. Uh, but I, there are some questions here. We, we can let you go a little bit longer, but... Uh, okay. I maybe will get the questions out of the way. First one is, is it better to photograph the moon when it's full or better when it's shading during the waxing and waning? Oh, definitely better for, for, for if you're not shooting the moon, uh, definitely better to shoot when the moon is totally out of the picture because uh, the brighter the moon is, the fuller uh, the moon is, the more it's going to uh, compete with, uh, with the light of the, of, the, uh, of the objects that you're shooting, such as this view in, in an aurora. Auroras are definitely not as dramatic or pretty when, when you're talking about, uh, uh, or when you're competing with a full moon. I think the question was though, about actually photographing the moon. What, what's the, what's the best time to photograph the moon? 
Oh, again, it depends on what you want to capture. Uh, That's true, uh, yeah. Full moons are full moons are great for doing things like the super moon uh, that we've got uh, happening, and uh, uh, when when the moon is in a, in in a, a phase other than full, you get the rich detail along the the terminator along the shadow line. When the moon is full, there are no shadows there, uh, and you're basically just looking at the at the light uh, albedo variations on the surface of the moon. Uh, shadows make it interesting, though, especially if you're zooming in. Okay. Uh, question here, would you say that the reduced pollution due to the pandemic uh, situation is enough reduction of the atmospheric particulates to make a difference for this sort of photography, or is it even noticeable? Uh, I, I actually heard a, a couple of reports about people saying that, uh, that they've noticed a difference. Uh, it really depends on uh, where you live and where you go to do your photography. Certainly, if you're closer to a city, if there's less particulates in the air, it's bound to help because that will mean less light scatter from, from city lights. But out in the country, uh, it, it's probably not much of a difference. Okay. Uh, final question. Canon or Nikon? Uh, both will do very good jobs. Uh, today's cameras have become super capable. Uh, they're, they're, you know, Sony, uh, uh, Minolta, Canon, Nikon, uh, they all have their strengths and weaknesses, uh, and, uh, but they, they, they are all capable of doing a, a really good job. A couple of manufacturers like Canon and Nikon have gone one step further and produced variations of cameras like the, for instance, the 60D uh, a couple of years ago from Canon they they put a, a a special filter over the uh, over the sensor which actually allows more uh hydrogen alpha light through than the normal standard sen uh filter that goes over that sensor so these uh, the, those cameras those types of cameras are are what we call enhanced cameras uh, because they give you a better spectral response and uh, to my knowledge i think only canon and nikon have done that uh, currently okay thanks paul you got about another uh, 5 minutes or so Okay, I'm going to speed through this. All right, so this I'm, I'm just going to show you this. This is one of my favorite things for doing camera uh, time lapses uh, with a with a stationary camera. Um, nightscapes. The, the this this is really interesting. Uh, we we do get auroral activity down here. Not much right now, but uh, the sun's activity is going to pick up in the next few years, so we can expect to see more. And by setting up your camera to to do one shot after another for an extended period of time. Uh, during an auroral display, you can then stitch that together with, uh, with various software to form a movie. And uh, I'll just show you a little bit of that here. So this is not a video. This is just individual shots that I took over about a six hour period, uh, almost 700 shots and stitched them together. And you can see that the aurora is a very dynamic and colorful um, phenomenon, a beautiful thing to watch. And again, to an earlier question, uh, the camera view versus the, 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 the naked eye view. Um, certainly, I saw some of this aurora with my eyes while I was photographing it, but I did not see the vibrant colors that you see here. And I didn't see the same extent of, 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 the, uh, uh, of the aurora. So uh, in the images, I see it much extending much higher up into, into, the, into the sky. And certainly uh, some of the very subtle color variations. Um, all I saw of those was more of a of a of a whitish light. Pretty cool stuff when it happens there, and it's uh, it's mesmerizing. All right, I'm going to skip out of this. Uh, just a quick reference for you, for those that are, are new to this, spaceweather.com is an excellent site for getting current information on stuff, interesting stuff happening in the night sky, whether it's auroras or meteor showers or comets in the sky. You can even sign up for an aurora alert, which, which will mean that you'll get a, an automated text message telling you that uh, auroras may be possibly seen in your part of the sky or your part of the world on a particular, uh, on a particular evening. So a good resource. All right, so I'm going to duck out of this presentation. Remember this view that I showed you here? We're going to talk just for a minute here or two about the last piece, and that's image processing. Virtually all image uh, astro images require some degree of processing, and I'm not going to go into any great detail here 
just the very most simple of adjustments here. Uh, for those of that par purchased DSLRs, Canon or Nikon, whatever, uh, your manufacturer supplies you with a very capable application with your camera that will decode the uh, raw images and give you a lot of flexibility in, uh, in, in maneuvering these images. I, I, I use this program, but I also use things like Photoshop and, and other various programs. Again, it depends how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go. The bottom line is that this is a freebie that comes with your camera and it's very capable. So I'm just going to open up that image. This, uh, this is the Canon version. It's called uh, Digital Photo Professional. I'm going to open that up and I'm just going to show you in a, in a minute or two here some of the most basic adjustments that you can make. All right. So in this, in this, this, this is our working image. In, uh, in this menu up here, you can adjust so many different things. I, I don't have time to go into all the detail, but I'll show you the two basic ones. This control here uh, called uh, the brightness adjustment allows you to manipulate your raw image. And this is, I say, this, this is not available if you're just shooting JPEGs, uh, but the raw image contains all the data that your camera captured and so you can manipulate it after the fact. For instance, things like the white balance, I can adjust that. I've got it set for daylight, but I can set it for things like cloudy and you'll notice how the image changes. Uh, I can set it for um, flash or I can set it for funky things like tungsten. You can see how it changes. And these are all settings that if you were just shooting JPEG, you would normally make out in the field, but uh, shooting raw, you don't have to fool around with that. You can do that. Uh, you can do that after the fact when you're in the comfort of your home. So I'm just going to set it back to daylight. You can also make various adjustments on things like the shadows. Oops, go the other way here to boost shadow detail. Uh, you can change the color temperature of the image, uh, all manner of adjustments like this. And again, I stress to you that astrophotography is an art. So there's no right way or wrong way of doing this. It's what it's what pleases you, right? You've taken the image, now create the final version uh, to your taste. This is the other one that I use actually a fair bit. Uh, it allows you to do tonal adjustments and you can see that it displays a histogram here. This is very useful because it shows you that uh, you can see three different colored peaks, blue, green, and red. It tells you that the blue is a little underexposed and that's, that's normal because uh, most cameras uh, are, are more sensitive in, in, in certainly in the green and, and in the red than they are in the blue. So often you have to adjust your blue unless, you're, unless you want a greenish sky, which I don't particularly like. Also down here, you'll see that as I move my cursor over the, over the image, those three numbers after RGB uh, show you the relative levels of those different colors, red, green, and blue in your image at the point over with, that your cursor is hovering over. And you can see that generally speaking, the blue is a bit depressed. So I can click on this. And now I can adjust the blue by taking this and dragging it over. And you can see that the peak is going to move to the left and it's going to be more in line with, uh, with the red and the green. And already I can see an improvement on, on the image, right? This also allows you to adjust things like the brightness one way or the other. Oops, a little bit too much there. And things like the contrast. I can also I can also go back to the to the raw display and I can do things like increase the color saturation. And you can see that the reds are becoming more prominent with this. And again, go back and forth. There's there's I haven't even touched on all the all the things that you can you can play with here the, that you can tweak and poke. You can make it brighter. And you can take the background and you can make the background darker by adjusting the left side of the histogram. So play with this until you get what you want. You can see that this is a this is quite an improvement over the uh, over the original image. And the beauty of this program as well is that you can save these adjustments in what's called a recipe. And that's really useful, especially if you're shooting time lapses, because then if you shot 600 images, you, you certainly don't want to make this adjustment manually to each one. You can, you can take one image, create a recipe like this, and then apply it to all the other images uh, to get the same type of adjustment. And then you can stitch them together into a pleasing time lapse. So 
very useful. And again, it's it's free with your camera. So uh, use it then and, and feel free to explore. So that's basically where I'm going to leave it. Uh, again, if you want to do things like distant galaxies and and nebulas and all sorts of things, you've seen what's uh, what's required. I would certainly recommend that if you haven't done any astrophotography at all, start simple and see if the bug bites because you can always uh, you can always jump further down the rabbit hole. Uh, but uh, if you make a big investment in scopes and, and high-end cameras and you wind up not really being interested, uh, that's a pretty big financial uh, uh, commitment. And you really don't want that type of equipment just sitting around in, in a basement or in the corner of your house not being used. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you. And uh, uh, if there's any time left, uh, I'm certainly open to more questions. I think we have to move on at this point, Paul, but thank you very much. If there are questions for him, um, I will forward them to him. Okay, sounds great. Have a good okay. evening. Thank you.